I'm David Sally. I'm primarily a painter. I do some other things as well. I spend a fair amount of time writing essays about contemporary art. I have in the past worked as a theater designer. I've designed sets and costumes for ballets and operas. And I've tried to pursue the things which really interested me and made sense for me to be engaged with, principally painting and writing. I grew up in Wichita, Kansas, a, a city that had uh, little grace notes of some cultural institutions. One of them was an independent art school that was not affiliated with any university. When I was a child, I was, had what we would now call a kind of classical art education. And then, when I went to so-called college or art school, it was exactly the opposite. There was a tremendously energizing contrast. CalArts was, for sure, was the lucky break, but at that time it was un quite unique, so it attracted uh, an incredible concentration of young people who were really interesting and really interested in doing something. And many of them became lifelong friends, like Jim Welling and Matt Mulliken, who I, I still see to this day. There's no reason that art has to be complicated or that the explanation for a picture has to be abstruse. There's simply no reason that it, it, the story of a painting can't be told in simple language. It doesn't mean the painting is simple. A painting might have many different things embedded in it which take some time to decode, but that decoding needn't be abstruse. My work in particular, I don't know if it's complicated exactly, but it's full. I think Ruskin said the nature of composition is the ordering of unequal things. So my compositions are rather complicated scores with counterpoint and maybe different rhythms, but I don't think any individual thing is complicated or beyond anyone's grasp who cares to engage with it. One just has to have a willingness to play. I think one of the problems people have with, with contemporary art is they assume that there's a backstory. The point that I try to make in the book, How to See, is that we all have reactions to things sort of innately, but we're trained to ignore those reactions in favor of reading the wall label. But the wall label is something that's been written by professional um, partisan uh, advocate, so to speak. What we're told we're supposed to be thinking is another way of saying that's the artist's intention. And there's a been, in, the, in contemporary art in the last 40 years or so, the artist's intention has been privileged over the result. I always tell people, as far as my own experience is concerned, I don't really want to, want to know anything about their intention. Just not interested. You know, that might be interesting later. But I don't want to go into it full of ideas about what someone's intention is. The only thing that matters in art is the absolute specificity of what one does and the inflection with which one does it. In my work, for example, very, very early on, when I was in my early 20s, I started to experience the world as simultaneously itself and it's hard to express, but kind of a representation of the idea of itself. That reality wasn't kind of the only reality. There was another level of reality behind that reality. This is before I knew anything about semiotics or deconstruction, deconstructionism. Later, when those works uh, started to emerge, I realized what I'd been experiencing was very much encoded in this kind of post-structural French thinking. But I sort of came to it on my own just from living in the world. And I wanted to make work which could somehow account for that doubleness and that dual thinking. And some, it took very literal forms, uh, a, a painting that somehow, where somehow the wall behind the painting became as important as the painting, or the 
the aperture on which the painting was hanging became part of the painting, or the painting was documented in different states and different times, and that became part of the painting. I mean, very flat-footed journeyman stuff. It took years to find more elegant and more eloquent, more personal expression of those ideas, but it, but it usually came down to, and still does in many, many cases, comes down to an idea of juxtaposition. And, and juxtaposition is really the art of compare and contrast, and that creates a kind of emotional key for the viewer. There are collages which are made in actual time and space at, at that scale. So I'm not working from maquettes. I just start with one thing on the canvas in its actual size and build out from there. I don't know where it's going as I go along. I just hope that it doesn't fall apart, and which it does sometimes. So there were, were things like Kleenex boxes and chocolate pudding and a lot of food images because they're, they're, they're fun to paint and they look great when they're scaled up cars. I would just start with one of those things. Well, I have a whole stack of images and I usually, at that size, usually project it to get the proportions correct. It's very hard to do freehand. It just feels like it wants to be this big. And then the painting grows from there. The paintings are full of arabesques and figure eight paths that your eye moves along. And what creates those paths are linkages of dark or light shapes. If you study enough Veronese paintings, you pretty quickly learn how to line up you know, diagonals and verticals and horizontals to intersect in such a way that it energizes the painting and gives your path some place to go. It's interesting to think about seeing works from the, that one made a long time ago. The two things to say about it, the contradictory things, one is that I'm glad I've evolved to the extent that I have and that it's been a hell of a journey. The other thing to say is I'm amazed and a little bit dismayed just how similar all the work really is, how it almost always goes to the same recognizable emotional place. Certainly in the early years that my work just kind of flowed out of me. That's how it felt, that's how I experienced it. It just flowed out of me. And I think I was very lucky that I was able to find a voice and a subject matter and a means of combining what I knew, the two fundamentally different vocabularies of art that I knew, find a way of combining them relatively early on. And once that threshold had been crossed, things did just kind of flow out of me without, I didn't really th think about it. They just, it was, there was always another group of pictures I wanted to make, another idea I wanted to try, and like a well, it kept, kept refilling itself. Now, that doesn't go on forever, but it went on for quite a long time. So there was a, a very interesting collector named Carlo Bellotti. And he came to me with this, with this idea of making paintings that directly referred to the Sistine Chapel. And it's, it's so overwhelming. It's so unbelievably huge in every sense of the word. The, the, I mean, out of all the biblical stories that are told in that ceiling, the, the obvious ones are the the Genesis, the Flood, and the, the Last Judgment. That's how they were made. And then they were installed in a, a building that sits in the middle of the Borghese Gardens in Rome. And then Carlo died. Luckily, uh, Carlo's family uh, got the paintings back. Tina Bellotti uh, gifted them to the parish, which is probably the best possible outcome because the parish is perfectly scaled for those paintings. And the three were installed recently at the parish for the first time since they were installed in, in, the, in the Orangerie originally in Rome. And they, they just seemed to, you know, suit the place and the place suits them. So it was a happy outcome.
the way I worked for many, many years, and still do to a certain extent, certain aspects of the work, um, was to paint from photographs. In the 70s, when I first started making something that was approaching my work, I drew on canvas from photographs that I had collected. So for a while I was working from so-called Fallon material. And I quickly realized what I needed to see was based not so much on the image, but on the light and shadow with which the image was rendered. You don't find photographs like that in magazines. So I started taking them myself. So from about 19, I don't know, 81 or so, 82, until the early 90s, I posed models in, with very specific, very particular lighting, very strong light and shadow, uh, oftentimes with kind of eccentric, bizarre costumes or sets. And those photographs form the basis for the figurative parts of the paintings. So they were photographs made specifically to be painted. They were just reference material, but they were very specific reference material that no one else would have made and no one else would have found interesting or no one else would have wanted to use. But for me, they, were, they just showed the effects of light on a, on a face, very strong light and shadow, how that galvanizes the attention in a certain way and it becomes, it makes something into a paintable object. They became autonomous art objects that had a very strong mood and very, very kind of strong specificity of time and place. Those pictures have the look that they have because of the camera I was using. I've tried to recreate that look and I have found it impossible. So it's, it's, a, it's a completely time-specific body of work. There's some value or some quality that advanced art gives to people who care to engage with it that, is, that simply can't be obtained any, any place else. I think it's one of perhaps art's real value is how is its singularity. It's not, it's, it's not like other things. It's not entertainment. It's not TV. It's not water cooler jokes. It's not banalities. It's, it's not texting. It's not shorthand for anything known. It's precisely the opposite of all those things. It comes to life through an absorbing engagement with it. And, it has, and if it's not absorbing, then it's, it's of no interest whatsoever. So I, I think that it, it, it stands out as a, one of our primary examples of engaging with life in that way. And it provides access to those kinds of feelings in a way that other things don't. And if that's of use to people, then that's great.